Welcome to Marketplace Tech Bytes. It's our weekly roundup of some of the big stories in tech and maybe some you missed. I'm Megan McCarty Carino. This week, we're talking NVIDIA. The chip maker is expanding its automation efforts. Plus, there's a new tool to evaluate AI models for healthcare. And digital health company Hinge Health files for IPO. Here to discuss all that is our regular contributor, Christina Farr at Manat Health. Hi, Christina, good to see you. Good to see you again, Megan. So we're going to start with our bite of the week. This is a number that gives us some insight into the week in tech. Christina, what number do we need to know this week? So my number this week is $6.1 billion. Um, I am not a big sports fan, but <laughs> I could not miss uh, the big news this week that the Boston Celtics got sold to private equity director Bill Chisholm. Um, for $6.1 billion, which is really a, a record-setting moment in the world of, of sports. And I've been reading a little bit about it and um, apparently is down to just all these new me media relationships and, and partnerships with groups like Disney and mm. NBC that are hitting the sports world. Um, so just fascinating to see that. And um, what a big exit and moment. Wow. Uh, well, you know, being from L.A., I am not a big Celtics fan, <laughs> but uh, we'll let that one go. Um, of course, I'm from everyone. London, so <laughs> can't say I'm a Celtics fan myself either. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's cool. Why not? Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about the big tech story this week, which was Nvidia. Uh, kind of a grab bag of headlines from Nvidia this week. Of course, they held their big GTC conference, GPU technology conference. Uh, Jensen Wong, their CEO, of course, clad in his uh, trademark leather jacket, gave a long, rambling two-hour keynote speech at this event. Uh, he covered a lot. He covered kind of the uh, upcoming Blackwell Ultra chips, Rubin GPOs. These are much more efficient. Uh, touched on the effect that the Chinese large language model DeepSeek uh, is having, but kind of expressed confidence that the demand for NVIDIA GPUs will only continue to grow. Perhaps the most crowd-pleasing moment came at the end of his speech. Let's take a look. Let's finish it up. We have another announcement. To <laughs> You're good. You're good. Just stand right here. Stand right here. There. That's good. All right, Stan. All right, so that is Blue, a robot that is literally straight out of Star Wars. It's a collaboration with Disney and Google DeepMind utilizing uh, NVIDIA's new physics model. It's just one of many cross-pollinations that NVIDIA announced this week, but definitely, I would say, the cutest one. <laughs> Christina, <laughs> what stood out to you with all these collaborations? Yeah, it seems like NVIDIA really is betting that there is going to be a rise of real-world applications of AI mm. from a variety of different industries, including the one that I'm in, which is healthcare. And you see NVIDIA really start to invest by both building out teams that can tackle some of these industries, and a lot of that requires collaboration. I don't think NVIDIA is ultimately going to be selling both the chips and the GPUs and the computing power and all of that good stuff, as well as building some of those applications. I, I predict that we'll see more and more just partnerships with these industries and with companies that are already subject matter experts within their specific domains. And all of that is good for NVIDIA because it just allows them to keep selling more and more and more. And just really proves the point that AI, you know, isn't overhyped. It's not just a kind of moment in time, but that it really is the next phase of computing. So one of the partnerships that was announced this week, not at GTC, but by BlackRock, was uh, this AI infrastructure partnership, which NVIDIA is a part of. So is Microsoft. So is XAI, which is Elon Musk's AI company that has built kind of the world's biggest AI supercomputer called Colossus. It connects 100,000 NVIDIA GPUs. What did you make of this? Yeah, I think it really speaks to the fundamental problem that we see with AI is, 
you know, how do we even have enough computing in the world? I mean, all of this stuff takes resources and infrastructure. It's actually a huge hit. I mean, I've been reading just in my spare time about just the impact it's been having on climate to be powering all of this AI. And so I think it could push us in, in some interesting directions, including into quantum computing, um, to be able to continue to support kind of this growing demand for AI. And I think that's what you're seeing now is just how do we address some of that? How do we band together? How do we figure out kind of new chips, new ways of just like allowing supercomputing um, to continue to thrive? And that's what I think this investment is really all about. All right, now we want to move on to how AI is being used and evaluated in healthcare in your domain. Uh, a new tool from Stanford called MedHelm is offering analysis of various AI large language models and how they perform various tasks in healthcare. It's been called like a consumer reports for AI and healthcare. I mean, first of all, Christina, remind us some of the ways that large language models are being deployed or potentially deployed in healthcare, and why is something like this important? AI is already making its way throughout our industry. It's being used in both front office applications, so scheduling, um, for instance, if you need an appointment in the back office, um, in areas like, you know, just administering medical claims, you see it in clinical as well. If you, um, many of us now are using applications that involve some degree of AI for things like triaging, for instance, like mm. which patients on a wait list should be seen by a specialist or a physician first. Um, these are some of the things that I'm seeing um, in my space already. But there are also challenges. And I, I love this effort because I think it really gets into one of the big ones, which is that not all, a, all AI applications are created equal. Um, not all of them are accurate. There is still just rampant problems with some of the results that you're seeing, including the fabrications. Um, and so I love this work of just kind of passing the good from the bad. And then also maybe making it clear why health systems and other kind of stakeholders in the industry should be investing in AI, because it is not cheap. And that's not something we talk about nearly enough. So I love things like this that just independently start to pass the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to AI applications and healthcare. Yeah, speaking of the ugly, I think we talked last year about some of the problems with an open AI tool called Whisper AI, which was being used to transcribe doctor visits and create summaries that were often riddled with hallucinations. So we are already seeing, you know, some of these real world problems pop up with these AI models that, you know, when you kind of just look at the benchmarks, they score very highly on, you know, medical licensure exams, but that doesn't necessarily always translate into flawless real world performance, right? Exactly. And I, I often think of it as sometimes garbage in, garbage out, because, um, you know, another thing we don't talk about is that these medical records are also just rife with human error. Right. I have a friend who, um, on her medical record, said, it said that she had been pregnant. Um, she had never been pregnant. Wow. But sometimes just errors end up, mm. you know, happening because of because of human beings. Sometimes humans make mistakes. And then it can take a really long time for any of this to get rectified. And I worry about some of this information being fed into the AI algorithms because it's not accurate to begin with. So, you know, many issues. And I think we're still very much in the thick of resolving some of some of it. It's still early days for AI. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk now about an IPO in the health tech sector. Uh, this is the health tech platform Hinge Health, not to be confused with the dating app Hinge, but this company focuses on providing digital health care, often through employer health plans, for things like physical therapy. Here is an example. You get a new exercise therapy session to do each day, or at least a few days a week. You get your own physical therapist who customizes your exercises and a health coach who helps you stay on track. All right, Christina, just looking around at the markets lately, it seems like a pretty gutsy time to be doing an IPO. Why is Hinge Health doing it now? So, Megan, I don't think anybody really knows the answer to that question. And within the industry, we've all been talking about it, discussing it behind the scenes, this why now question. I think part of it might just be that Hinge has been around for a while. 
And they've raised a lot of money um, and they have a high valuation. And at a certain point, you need to exit. And so maybe that time is now. I think they've also been testing the waters for a while, talking to a lot of banks and just maybe hearing enthusiasm about the business overall. Mm. There's a lot to like about Hinge Health. They've got really strong growth, strong fundamentals, a lot of revenue. And the market that they're in, which is MSK, you you um, pointed to kind of this PT example, the whole category being just a space of musculoskeletal health. Mm. It's a huge market. I don't think really we've even taken into account how big it is. We're talking like tens of billions spent every year on unnecessary surgeries that people mm. do not need if they just had access to PT. So I think they've got a really strong value prop. I like the business for a lot of reasons. But like you said, it's a really hard time to IPO. So the whole industry is just watching this one so, so closely to see how it goes. Because if it goes well, I think it just really opens up the market for a lot of companies to go out, go public. And finally, we start to see some liquidity in the health tech space. Right. I mean, there are some sort of fundamentals going for anything in health tech right now, just given some of the demographic realities that are you know, society is facing with the the boomer generation, you know, aging into a time when they're going to need more health care. Um, so is that sort of uh, uh, a tailwind for, for all health tech right now? I would hope so. Um, we, we desperately need innovation because like you said, we've got a growing aging population. Um, we're just not producing as many, you know, children to be able to support that population there's just a crisis at, right now. And we've got just spend that is absolutely out of control. Healthcare has become a almost $4 trillion sector in the US. It's just enormous. And so I would love to see more companies be able to really take some of the waste and the costs out of the system and provide value to patients, to providers. That said, it's definitely one of the hardest categories. I wouldn't recommend it for someone who wants to make a quick buck. But if you're in it, you know, for, the, for all the right reasons and you want to make an impact, like, Come, <laughs> we need you. Come fix healthcare with us. <laughs> All right, Christina Farr from Manat Health, thanks so much. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for watching Marketplace Tech Bytes Week in Review. Asus Alvarado produced this episode. I'm Megan McCarty Carino. This is APM.